Welcome back to On Guard Cigar Salon. I'm Mr. Christopher. I'm Graylin Thornton. I'm Ray Spannon. And I'm the Cigar Pig. And we are back for our third season. Wow. Woo. Isn't that big? Yeah. Woo. That's That's big. Good. I didn't think we'd last this long, truthfully. <laughs> <laughs> I know, we haven't killed you. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most surprising thing yet. <laughs> um, and our last episode was about Tom of Finland and how art influenced a culture. And we get together every week and we talk about all sorts of things. But the other thing we do is we listen to music while we have our little private salons. And this one, big, can go on forever about music. So we thought we would do a whole episode about music and the most influential songs we ever had. And one of the things that brought this up was um, the youngins kind of being reintroduced to some of the music we used to listen to. And recently they that came to light was Running Up the Hill, Kate Bush was in Stranger Things. That took off and made her chart again. Uh, we also had uh, Murder on the Dance Floor uh, in Saltburn. Uh, that's a 20 year old song by Sophie Ellis Baxter. Uh, Beyonce's been doing remixes of Vogue. Uh, she also did uh, Before I Let Go um, mm -hmm. by Maze. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of interesting to see music we kind of had in our, that we think of as just every day, and now it's just getting this resurgence. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that too? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've definitely oh. noticed it. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and, and I love it. I talk to younger people and they actually know some of the music from my era because they've been re reintroduced to it. What amazes me is I like those reaction videos. And it's all these young 20 year olds, which is fantastic, reacting to music that we grew up to in the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s. And their reactions are hilarious. One, not 100%, but at least 90% of the time, really positive and liking it and it resonating. And I'm Amp, still here, though never introduced. My favorite song was Kanye and Paul McCartney did a single, and all the kids online were like, oh my god, this, this Paul McCartney guy's gonna take off. <laughs> it took everything within the power of my generation, probably your generation as well, to be like, excuse your face. <laughs> but just goes to show like the, the resurgence of music does sure. fully get bolstered by new media, Saltburn. Right. Stranger Things, which, did either of you guys watch those? I, I watched Saltburn. Saltburn. Yeah. Okay. Saltburn. You watched Stranger Things? Mm-hmm. With you. What was happening during the running of that hill scene? Some tree was growing, <laughs> and she was going up in the air, and it was, she she was out of body, and died, and then came back. I don't wow. know. Wow, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> you asked. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> But, and, and we've talked a lot. You love those two YouTubers who watch. I love them. I think, I think what were they? They didn't well, know that Janis Jop Joplin wasn't black. Right. One, and when they didn't, and they heard it, and what I loved about it was they 100% loved Janis. They really responded to her energy and just the rawness. And it was funny because there was one when they looked and they were like, oh. Well, what was the song? It's a girl. What was the song? Do you remember? Peace of my heart. Peace of my heart. Can you give yeah. us a little rendition? No, but you know who's a good singer? <laughs> Raylan used no. to perform at Great American Music. And this is, and this is not yes, part of the fight, show. Fight, fight, not fight, part fight, of the show. Fight, fight. All right, I'm gonna not put you <laughs> back in your corners. So what I asked you all to do is come up with five songs that really impacted your life and tell us why. But now we have rules of engagement because some people. Great one. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so what I'm going to do is we're going to go around and we're going to talk about five different songs. I'm going to put an egg timer on for two minutes. When that ding is done, you're done. So, since we did five songs, two minutes each, we get 10 minutes. Can we ration that 10 minutes how we choose? Oh my what God. kind of? No! <laughs> Over here. Just play by the rules. God. My first one may be a little we'll over, so it. don't ding me. Everybody see what we're up against okay. here? So, <laughs> since this is uh, the pig's uh, oh. <laughs> vanity project, <laughs> let's start with you. Okay. okay, you ready? I'm putting the egg timer on for two minutes. There you go. Go three. Okay. Don't go three. <laughs> so <laughs> the instructions were, and I think it's good, is what formed us? What do we think in terms of music that really, you know, started us um, thinking, I guess, or just being influenced by? 
And I was raised in a very large Irish Catholic family that, you know, I don't know if most people know with Irish Catholics, as long as you go to church on Sunday and you go to, you know, Catholic school, that meets your requirements. So you really didn't talk about it much or anything. But when I was a kid, because I was born in the 50s, raised in the 60s, you know, it was ubiquitous that God was fine and that, you know, religion is all good. And, you know, you just lived this way. And then this song, the first song I chose, is a song that Joan Baez performed. It was written by Bob Dylan. But it's one of the things that made Bob Dylan become famous before he was because she, you know, she, um, she discovered him. So what I'll do is I just want to read two different stanzas to it, and you'll see why it had such an impact on this little Catholic kid who I had never once heard anything other than positive and, you know, like, of course, it's religion and it's all true. So the first stanza is this. It says, oh, the history books tell it. They tell it all so well. The cavalry's charged and the Indians fell. The cavalry's charged, the Indians died, and the country was young with God on its side. And then there's many, many. It goes through history, but this one was also very, very impactful to me. Um, it said, the Second World War came to an end. We forgave the Germans, and then we were all friends. Though they murdered six millions in the ovens they fried, the Germans, too, now have God on their side. And, you know, when I was a young teenager, I had never, ever heard of anybody saying anything about how, you know, religion influences what happens in the world. But, you know, after that, for the rest of my life, no matter what it is, the homophobes, the xenophobics, the misogynists, it's always connected to religion. And I've got to tell you, that song, if you listen to it, listen to it from Joan because she has a beautiful voice. But it's just so impactful because it is not sung in a nasty or accusing way. It's just very matter of fact, and it's incredibly powerful. And it's affected me my whole life. I am so impressed you got that under two minutes. Yes. Because <laughs> we could talk for hours. You made us go see your documentary. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you love Joan Baez. Okay. And, and, and rightfully so. You've got to go see it. We've got to go see it. You've got to go see it. And rightfully so. She was an amazing woman, still is. Right. And artist. And uh, just activist. speak of some of the things that she did as an activist. Well, she was with Martin Luther King from the beginning. Why look at me? I'm not. Because <laughs> you're sitting across from him. Exactly. Everybody calm down. <laughs> but, you know, I'll tell you something. She, after this song, it was one of the things. She was attacked constantly. And Andy Cap. In the, in the old days, we used to get the newspaper, and they used to be the color comics. And Andy Cap yeah. did the most popular, it was called Little Abner. And for three months, every single week, he did a series called Phony Joni. And it was all about mocking Joan Baez for her stance on the war, uh -huh. um, for her peaceful activism, and just relentlessly attacked her and she was attacked everywhere and you know what she's still performing until last year she's one of those people she's got like 80 albums out when she wasn't hitting the charts she still kept performing music if you look online which there is google she shows up at kosovo she showed up in every war she is just a really incredibly you know committed I don't think your timer is working. My timer is not working. I like <laughs> this. <laughs> so, was she, is she clear? I actually don't know. She isn't, but you know what's interesting? Years ago, they did bring that up, and they said something about her being a lesbian, and she never, ever said no. She was like, oh, okay. Yeah. And nobody ever did it in the 70s. She was like, oh, all right, I don't care if you think that good. When, when, we, <laughs> when the big women's march happened... Um, at, here in San Francisco, uh, as a surprise, she came out on, out on stage just before we were all taking off to march, and she sang two songs to kick us off. Well, you know, she showed up at City Hall during the White Night Riots. Oh, I didn't. And, yeah, yeah, she did, and she was the one singing We Shall Overcome. Mm -hmm. And don't you know, she's the one that got bashed, you know, in the press because she was, but she shows up. She does. All right, so that was a good two minutes, even though I think you cheated. <laughs> <laughs> so Don't take it out and post. Now we are, so I'm going to tell you a secret. We privately told each other what our five songs were, except Graylin Thornton kept it private 
till now. So we don't know what his five songs are. So we're very curious. What's your first one, Graylin? My first song. <laughs> well, you know, we, we talk about how it influenced us as being queers and Leatherman and Kink, but for me, it goes back much further than that because before I knew I was queer or kinky, I was black. And I think the song that really hit that for me was James Brown's Say It Loud, I'm Black. Don't, you, you're not black and proud, so just stop it. Okay. We can like the song. It's no, okay. no, you can't. This is, this is cultural so appropriation. The I, the so trailer, we're fighting over the artist. Okay. <laughs> but now, back to me being black. Um, it's because, you know, back at that time, we weren't used to being proud. We weren't used to being beautiful. So suddenly in the 60s, James Brown was saying, say it loud, we're black and we're proud. And we were doing that. And then we discovered, hey, black is beautiful. Right. And then, you know, we had uh, Little Nairobi in Palo Alto. And so I think that that song for me just made me feel that I'm no longer the child of slaves. Right. I'm the child of kings and queens. Right. And we are beautiful and we are proud of that. So that's why I picked that as my first song. Mm. Good choice. Good choice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what was funny was they were fighting over black artists before this. No, he said, you can't have any black artists. Because I, <laughs> I wanted Stevie Wonder living by the oh, but, but, It's not your turn, Peg. <laughs> All right. I'm glad we have a moderator. Um, <laughs> Wait, where was the egg timer? <laughs> oh, the, I knew Graylin wouldn't go over his time. Uh, so, <laughs> race. What an egg timer is just for the pig. <laughs> race, what is yours? Um... Mine is Light My Fire by The Doors. Uh -huh. uh, 1967, so I would have been 13 years old. Wow. Very formative age. Mm -hmm. I, I was pretty precocious as sexually. Um, so I saw this, to me, gorgeous man on stage in leather pants with a bulge. So yes, it's supposed to be about the music, but, <laughs> but he influenced oh. me so much. I lusted after him so much. I would play his music over and over. I played the album, the single. I would look at photos of him. I would Singer in leather do pants. things okay. privately, <laughs> looking at his picture. Um, so it really was the first time that somebody in leather pants kind of did it for me. And that was pretty formative. I mean, look. He was gorgeous. Yeah, he was. Is that the first time you saw someone in leather that was part of like pop culture? That resonated with me, yeah. I mean, I might have seen somebody before, but it didn't hit me like that. It didn't look like him. It didn't look like him for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was very powerful. Yeah. Uh, was that also when you discovered mushrooms? Mushrooms, no. <laughs> no, 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 that was later. <laughs> well, we used to call it psilocybin, and now yeah. they're calling it mushrooms. Yeah. Because who wants to say psilocybin? That's not hot. <laughs> you know? And mushrooms is? Mushrooms is kind of hot, you know. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I'm going to follow, so I'm going to preface this. My, my childhood, I grew up in a very super religious Pentecostal right-wing household. We were not allowed to watch TV or listen to any secular music. I am a little, and I'm, I don't want to say a lot younger than you guys, but I am a little younger than you. So <laughs> I didn't start listening to music and really getting into music till I hit about 18 years old. And when I did, I had moved out of my Pentecostal house. Um, I was free to listen to any media that I wanted. And so I kind of went down this alternative music. So this, we're talking 1990 through 92. And so I started hanging out with this punk rock group because I knew I was gay, but I wasn't ready to admit I was gay. And so they were listening to all sorts of like the, the, and, uh, the Ramones and all these bands that I got into, but one that hit me really hard was XTC, um, and they had a song on their Skylarking album called Dear God, and because I had grown up so religious, 
this song hit me hard because I was like, this is everything I've always thought. And it was questioning the existence of God. Uh, it was kind of just, uh, one of the lyrics in it, in it was, uh, did you create us or did we make you? And it just started listing everything that was wrong with the world and kind of blaming it on God. And it just, it gave me this freedom of, a freedom from religion for the first time. And I used to play that song over and over and over. And it got this powerful drum beat to it um, as it listed all those things. And I was very, it, it just, it just hit me hard. So that was the first song that really resonated with me and I had the freedom as an adult to uh, listen to, I guess. I, so. I think it's interesting that both of your songs are similar in the sense that it, it impacted you with freedom from religion or at least rethinking it Absolutely. in a way that your childhood didn't allow you to do. Right, because right, you just never, it was just ubiquitous that it's good and you're going to think it's good and you better say it's good. And then all of a sudden, you know, here are these popular figures saying, no, well, here's what we also think. And it's powerful. Sure. And, and what was interesting about the song was it started with a child's voice and it was like writing a letter to God. It was, dear God and of questioning the existence of him. And so my favorite song was from Ecstasy. And speaking of Ecstasy, you should check out our sponsor, Leather Daddy Skin Co. So Leather Daddy Skin Company is a plant-based skincare line with a kinky twist. Leather, scotch, vanilla, and 18 erotic spices are bound to get the blood flowing, getting you ready to dominate your day. If you use offer code ONGUARD, you'll get 10% off your order. So thank you very much, Leather Daddy Skin Co. What's your favorite product that puts you in ecstasy Leather Daddy Skin Co? <laughs> the beard oil. Ooh. I use the body lotion every day. I like the body lotion, and we know you like. The butt scrub. <laughs> Tasty <laughs> hole. Tasty <laughs> hole. <laughs> Tasty <laughs> hole. Thank, thank you, Leather Daddy, Daddy Skin Co. Co. All right, Pig. What's your second Here's one? Here's my second one. My second song, again, is one by Joan Baez. I'm a big fan. But it's called The Altar Boy and the Thief. And it's a song totally about um, her experiences and um, her gay friends in gay bars. And it, this one came out in the 70s. And at the time, I worked at a gay bar that during the day was straight lunches and then turned gay at night. Remember when bars used to do that? And you know the interesting thing about it? It is the only song to this day that is 100% about our culture and about us that's truthful but positive. And it was unheard of in the 70s. And, you know, where her popularity with some was very big, but it was waning because of her politics. You know, again, she came out and just did it because it was the right thing to do. And to this day, there's never been a song that I've heard that is 100% so gay positive as the altar boy and the thief. What made it about our community? Because I hear altar boy and I think trauma. <laughs> <laughs> well, as an altar boy. And I was an altar boy. It, just the words to it, if you hear, and what, what I think that she tried to do was to get the whole range of people, like everybody is fine and everybody is accepted here, I think. Not if somebody watches it, but it's a fantastic song. It's, wow, and under two minutes. I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm saving my time. <laughs> Reclaiming your time. Reclaiming, Reclaiming my time. Okay. Reclaiming Matter my fact. time. <laughs> Reclaiming my time. You don't get to do that either. <laughs> Perfect. Graylin, what's your next one? Um, well, From you've heard this deal. story. I think I know race has. My godparents were um, hippie Jewish people from the 60s, and they really shaped me, and uh, and they still do. But for my 12th birthday, they took me to see the I Can Tina Turner review. Uh. And I always thought it was at the Fillmore, but I was 12 years old, and they corrected me, and they said it was at a place called the Basin Street West in North Beach. And uh, when, when I went to see Tina Turner, it was a nice little crowded, smoky bar full of all black people, except for my Jewish godparents and me. And um, Tina Turner sang uh, Proud Mary, and it started off with Ike's deep voice, and then it went into Tina, and then the Ikeettes joined in, and I thought it was the most sexual thing I had ever seen. I was 12 years old, 
I was turned on. Tina was up there bumping and grinding. And there was so much sex in that room that it really awakened me sexually. Um, Shortly after that, my, my godparents took me to my first nude beach. And so as a young 12-year-old, I was really waking up sexually. So that song was such an inspiration for me because it let me know that sex was OK. Wow, That's at 12 great. years old. 12 years old. I was at the pick. I can Tina Turner review. Also, uh, if if uh, the kids don't know about Tina Turner, uh, What's Love Got to Do With It, played by Angela Bassett, she did an amazing oh, job God, yeah. being Tina Turner. Yeah. And she was up for an Academy Award for that. And oh, that was 1992 she did that movie. Yeah. It was wonderful. It's, it, if you haven't seen that, you need to check it out. Her life story mm -hmm. is just amazing and how she cut ties with Ike Turner and the abuse she suffered oh, in yeah. going solo. And just rose and became, you know. She became a, Tina Turner. She right? became Tina she Turner. She was no longer Ike and Tina Turner. Man, and she, she kept her name. She kept, that's her all name. she wanted that's was that yeah, name. I'll give up all that other stuff, but only if I get to keep my name. But when you saw her, did she wear the hair dress? She did. I and know. You know I wanted to I be know. a Icat so badly <laughs> after that. She used to, oh, my were, God. Yes, the I fringe, with the hair. shaking the tail feather, the shake all the tail that. Feather. Well, oh, yeah. Saw her, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good one. That's a good uh -huh. one. You're, you're keeping good secrets. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Race. What's you got now? So, uh... My next song is Revolution by the Beatles. Ah, mm. So it was the next year after the first song I talked about, 1968, so I'd be 14. Mm -hmm. And it was on the White Album. Mm -hmm. And it ignited the activist in me mm. because it was about activism. Mm -hmm. it was, and it was about peaceful activism. In fact, the Beatles got some pushback oh, yeah. because a lot of the activist community then wanted to be much more aggressive with their activism, and he was all about very peaceful activism. Right. So there was a little bit of uh, negotiation. He even re-recorded a lyric and changed it slightly, And because there's a revolution, and there's a revolution one, and there's a revolution nine. Nine, right. Um, the other thing is that the White Album was the favorite album of the guy I was boinking when I was 14 in high school. Boinking. I was boinking. <laughs> boinking. Well, it was the Beatles. You had to. Yeah. You had to yeah. boink. I was for boinking. All audiences. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to, you know. Um, and uh, so I am absolutely sure that my brain and my hormones put together the song and the White Album and this guy that was really my first full out sexual experience at 14, like with somebody like, we're doing it regularly. Uh, so that's my favorite song. And it. it did inspire the activist in me. Can I ask what's, what lyrics did they have to change or? or... I do not remember okay. exactly which yeah. lyrics, but I do remember they, that it was changed slightly in one of the recordings. Why, why were the Beatles so important? They, they were like oh. the first band to really globally just take and, everything by storm. And in the States, when they appeared on Ed Sullivan, yeah. that's when they blew up. They blew up. And they were everywhere. And they were so culturally influential. They were the first band of that kind. They were they the first were, boy band. For, yeah. <laughs> well, and they were the first ones to say, listen, rock and roll is all rooted in black blues and jazz. Yep. And that's why they put on that album, Twist and Shout. Mm -hmm. And they were the only ones who ever said, listen, rock and roll is 100% based in American jazz and black blues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, look at Elvis. All his songs stolen. were right. yeah. stolen. I love that. <laughs> stolen. Big Mama Thornton. Big Mama Big Thornton. Mar Ma Rainey. Yes. Ma and her black bottom. <laughs> No, Black Belly. Black <laughs> Belly Blues. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, see, I... My next song that was very influential to me was, uh, so again, graduating from college in 1992, um, Annie Lennox, uh, she broke away from the Eurythmics and did her first solo al album. And um, I, for a graduation gift from college, I was given this gift to go to Europe for the very first time and take, and ha I had a Eurail pass. That was the one album I had, the Diva album from Annie Lennox, on a little cassette tape in my Walkman. And I played that entire album over and over and over, watching the French countryside, the Belgian countryside, oh, that's great. down yeah. through Spain to Barcelona. And, <clears throat> but the biggest song on that was Why. 
Uh, and if you ever watch the video of that, she's putting on drag. Um, she go and it's actually the album cover of Why, and she's got this like showgirl drag that she puts on. Um, but she just continually asks this question, Why? And just coming out of college, um, not knowing where I was going next, it kind of made me question uh, my mother and the roots that I had. Uh, with her, but then also questioning my own sexuality, questioning uh, my commitment to leather, uh, the leather community, and 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 I ended up in Amsterdam, listening to that album, and got my first job at Rob of Amsterdam. <laughs> so <laughs> it kind of all culminated into this: this is where you're going in life next. And but I could listen to that album over and over and to this day it's my go-to album to listen to whenever I write it. Why? Why? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the question's never answered. <laughs> Why? Uh, yeah, I, I happen to revere her because she unabashedly kind of gender bended in a way oh, nice. that mm -hmm. was not done at the time. Right. Even with your rhythmic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Your sweet dreams are made of these. Mm -hmm. You know, had a very S and M undertone to it. Very her. much. <laughs> yeah. And and so she had guts to do that yeah. and she did. be herself and so phenomenal I'm, voice. Phenomenal voice. And that's what I kind of miss. And I I, I that's I, I miss artists and hearing their voices. Now everything is so uh, synthesized and auto-tuned and from the Britney to even Cher, she, she keeps doing that. She has a great voice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I miss original artists and the sound of their voice and you just don't hear that very yeah. much anymore. Everything's yeah. so overproduced. I, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, remember when she came out during the London Olympics, mm. during the opening ceremonies, just the amount of respect that she got from oh, yeah, people yeah. was just overwhelming. Was. I, that was one of my favorite moments of that whole thing. Well, when I was, you know, working in HIV care, you know, she was one of the biggest proponents globally that came out. And she was the one who started, remember, this I think was in the 80s, where they had the disc, it was red, hot, and blue, where she got all yeah. these artists. Oh, yeah. 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 Remember that? Yes. And that was all yeah. done by Annie Lennox. I forgot about that. Yeah. Great album. Yeah. Yeah, that's Great album. Great album. Okay. My third song, I have to say, is Ohio by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And the reason why, this goes along with the other two, where it's changed me to this day. When I was a new nurse, and I know you're going to put some graphic in about that. But, um, <laughs> I didn't say baby nurse. Okay. <laughs> okay, RuPaul's Drag Race Queen editing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was a union steward. I, w I was a young nurse. And um, the person, I think they were like the head union person, was Tom Grace who I know he's out there a lot. And um, when they swear you in, they do this thing that you promise to represent everybody equally. And it was the first time I ever heard anybody said, including sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And Tom Grace, he was brilliant and such a committed guy. He was one of the nine people that survived the shooting at Kent State. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll never forget him describing how they were just peaceful protesters. There was absolutely nothing but signs. And the Ohio National Guard came and shot into the crowd and killed four people and wounded nine. And he was shot in the ankle and he still walked with a cane. And I'll never forget this because afterwards we went out to this park, you know, after all these union meetings. And he said, you know, you really need to watch what's happening in California with the Briggs Initiative. And, if, you know, this is one thing that unions are looking at nationally because, you know, if you don't realize it, they don't want you to be licensed as a registered nurse and they don't want teachers to be able mm -hmm. to teach. And it was this straight guy back then in the 70s. He, he came up to me, you know, I was out and gay, and was so committed in saying, you, the, you know, you need to be fighting this. You know, and it was just amazing how this guy, he purposely said, you know, you, you really need to watch out for this. They're, they're coming for us. And this was in the 70s. And I look at it today. I think people that weren't alive then couldn't believe that a National Guards group came up and shot into a crowd of 100 
100% peaceful people who had absolutely no arms, it's signs. And so don't think that it can't happen. It can and it did. And it is. And I think that's really important. I think that's a really good point because I think the kids think this is just starting for in this generation. We have been fighting this for four well, generations, and it's been the longer. hardest well, doing see. a spotlight. Like Taylor Swift now is doing right. it, and Beyonce is That's like it. doing a spotlight on the political wrongs that right. are happening to us. But we've had artists before them that came up and were doing the same thing. Absolutely. You know, and people don't realize that they killed Medgar Evers, they killed Martin Luther King, they killed JFK, they killed Bobby Kennedy. All of that happened within five years. Mm -hmm. And it was the same time when Nixon ordered the National Guard to shoot into that crowd of mm -hmm. totally unarmed, peaceful protesters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You brought up Dylan. I mean, um, all of his songs were protest songs. All of them. You know, the funny thing about him was he couldn't really sing. I mean, At he all. had no voice, but then we just listened to his yeah. songs over and over and over. I know. Well, that's what I love. With David Which is why John shown by us. <laughs> well, you know, and, and exactly. That's what, but, you know, nice. David Bowie did a song on Hunky Dory called um, Robert Zimmerman, because that's Bob Dylan's real name. Mm -hmm. And it says, hear this Robert Zimmerman with a voice like Sand and glue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then the song goes on to praise him for right. his poetry right. and yeah. It's like Patty Smith. Yeah. She didn't have a voice, but she's brilliant. Right. She does have oh, time. What was that? Time. That was I think that was time. <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good clip. Okay, Graylin, you're up. All right. Next. So my next song. <laughs> um so back in the day when I was like 18, 19 years old, I was a uh, performer at Great America, and we were so whitewashed there. You know, we were I was the lightest black guy there. And so I was on stage, they could see me, but the other black guys who were darker than me, they were in costume. And so at the end of our Sunday show, we do six shows, we always go to the I-Beam because we wanted to see Sylvester. Oh. And so- What's the I-Beam? Don't, uh, don't try to gloss over that. Okay, the I-Beam was a club, a dance club back in the 80s and early uh, 90s. And you saw Sylvester. Sylvester was always there. Yeah, I'm jealous. And that's why we went to the I-Beam on Sundays. We'd get on the stage, Patrick Cowley, who was Sylvester's, um, keyboardist and, and DJ would be playing there. So the little Great America kids would all get on the stage and dance in our, our best slutty With attire. Sylvester? With Sylvester? And it was a thing. And so you had to get there right away to get a spot on the stage. And then Sylvester would come out and he'd sing, you know, Disco Heat <laughs> and all those songs. And so, you know, there was a drag queen who was on stage singing to big gay audiences with us just dancing like it was no big deal. I and it. for me, that was like the first time I'd ever really seen someone like Sylvester being accepted, although straight people thought that he was straight like Liberace. <laughs> but, <laughs> no. but even, even kids my age and younger, who's Sylvester? What are they known for? Uh, you have to explain oh. that. You do. Really? You yeah. Do. No, this is why we're doing this it's, show. Yeah. Don't Sylvester? Know Sylvester. But his music is still uh, living know. today. It, 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 but they don't know that that's Sylvester that, yeah. that's being sampled in these remixes. Oh. Oh. You don't think? No. Jeez. I know so that's that. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they just put a big mural of him on the um, Oasis, yeah, on the Oasis, the Oasis I, I, I Actually, if you want, the, one of the, the best interviews of Sylvester was by, uh, uh, on The Tonight Show, when uh, Joan Rivers was filling in for Johnny Carson, she had him on the show, and it's a great interview. She was like, oh, I, I don't think I've ever seen no, it. I know, I gotta see that. But then, you know, he there was him, then there were the two tons of fun, uh, just oh, this, God, whole, oh, this whole music thing that was happening in the 80s and 90s with disco, and we were so free and gay it and was happy. Gay, exactly. Well, disco was big, and that was a big part of our coming out as well, mm -hmm. because our social Socialization wasn't as much. I, th I think the socialization in queer spaces has changed a bit from dancing. Dancing has now gone to circuit parties. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to go to the clubs to hook up and dance. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. That Studio 54. All of that yep. was to go dance, hook boogie, up. and mm -hmm. hook up. In, and that was our yeah. social pleasure dome. And so, yeah. so uh. disco was a big part of our community. Oh, absolutely. Oh, oh and up oh, in the 70s. 
seventies. Yeah. when I cut my hair. What when I was living in Chicago, <laughs> I would go to a, uh, a disco called the Bistro. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it was a block away from the Gold Coast, the big leather bar. So I would go dance to Sylvester and everybody else, uh-huh. then I'd run home, put my leather on, and go to the leather bar to hook oh, yeah. up. But it was an integral part of our life. It was just. There. They, well, they I we, lived in New York and went to the Ice Palace, and we yeah. didn't dress up because then I used to go downtown to go to the Anvil or the Mine Shaft that was just, you know, back room bars after after hours. I, I think one of the great things about growing up in San Francisco, though, is because being young leather people, we could go dancing in our leather, and it was right. a thing. And you see, you know, leather guys out there flagging at Trocadero. Or and all, Oh, yeah. Oh, the tambourine. Oh, tambourine. <laughs> yeah. Remember, there yes. was always a queen it with was a so much fun. on the floor, right? We had so much fun. And we it did. wasn't it wasn't as druggy as I remember. No. But we were just no, out there having fun. a big thing on the dance oh, floor. Oh, God. Hoppers on the dance floor. <laughs> right. Oh, my God. From, from, from but from drugs were safer then. Question. Was there ever a murder on the dance floor? <laughs> no, but that no, might be You better not kill the groom. But, but the, uh, <laughs> you know, and the DJ saved our lives, but other than yeah. that. You know, and <laughs> circling back to what you said about singers, when I've seen Sylvester perform mm-hmm. many times, mm-hmm. perfect, wonderful, right. gorgeous voice coming out of this band with no processing, no synth, with an old style mic, and it was mm-hmm. amazing. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And you say, well, here in the Bay Area, I was in the East Coast. You got to be on stage with Sylvester. It I was, mean, it that's was a, a big deal. But you know, I have to say, we didn't really understand his ah. impact yeah. then. Mm-hmm. You know, to us, it's like, oh, Sylvester's going to be at the I Beam, let's go dance. You know, so it wasn't, we didn't really know, no. you know, his impact at that point. Because he didn't have a legacy at that yeah. point. Not yet. It was, but yeah. he, was the he was building. He was building, and we were living it. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah you, you are. You, you are. don't understand it at that time. No. I'm curious though, like how, how does it make you feel seeing the Kate Bushes or the murders oh. on the dance floors getting a, a second, third, maybe even their first top charts in the US, you know, like how does that make you guys feel? Because I'm like, oh my God, I've never heard of Kate Bush, literally had never heard of that song before uh, Stranger Things. Oh, it's... No disrespect. Lovely song. <laughs> yeah. I, I shows, uh, Kate but... Bush was uh, <laughs> amazing. Kate, yeah, she was. Her, Lori Anderson, yeah. uh, just. Everybody. Yeah. I, was it Kate Bush the first one to use the Moog synthesizer yeah. to record? But I think so. I saw a thing where Kate Bush said, oh my God, I'm back on the charts and I'm making right. more money than I did the first time this came <laughs> to out. To answer your shocked. question though, it floods us with memories. Yeah. yeah. Because those were songs that were shaping our early 20s and 30s, um, maybe even younger. Um, that was part, part of our culture that we yeah. lived every time. So it, I love seeing it. But you know, I, I will admit something. I think back in those days, I was so immersed in the black community and dancing and even my leather friends, I hung around with more people of color. I had never heard of Kate Bush oh. until what? you guys brought her up the other day. Oh, really? Wow. Never heard of her. Oh, wow. No. Yeah, okay. Really? We didn't, yeah, I didn't really listen to I white mean, artists. Well, I, 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 was, I was listening to a lot of alternative music. She was considered alternative yeah, music okay. at that time. Um, so she was a big one for me. She was. Uh, yeah, me too. Yeah, I yeah. heard Stranger Things. Okay. All right. Great. Race. Next one. My next song is um, David Bowie. Um, Rebel Rebel. Uh, that, so that'd be 1974, I'd be 20. Uh, and that song was incredibly influential. It just hit me for some reason. Um, it also um, kept making me remember that it was David Bowie that gave me the courage to come out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. About three years before that, he came out as bisexual. Mm-hmm. And he was appearing on television in drag and glam. And gender just bending. Total gender First bending. gender bender. And I remember th- thinking to myself, if he can be on television and be proudly bisexual, um, I can come out. And I was out to a few people, but then all of a sudden the doors just opened and at 17, I just came out. And so he is responsible in many ways for me having the courage to come out and be open. And so, and of course, Rebel Rebel, the song itself was me, Maverick, Rebel, erotic, ma- you know, Maverick, et cetera. It, it, I just completely related to what he was saying because it was any of us that are Mavericks, we are all Mavericks just being kinky. And so he was saying, yep, be that rebel. Love Explain it. what a maverick is, because I think a lot of people think it's a gun. Oh, maverick. That doesn't feel very queer or ma- um, 
because I used to call myself a, a, an erotic maverick, a sexual maverick, and that means that you, um, you, you, you're ready to color outside the lines. Yeah. Oh, that's a good description. Yeah. Well, it, it, interesting, the two uh, leather magazines, uh, Drummer was about uh, having a drummer. It was mm -hmm. a, from a uh, mm -hmm. poem about mm -hmm. marching to a different beat. Yeah. That's why it was called Thoreau, Rubber I Magazine. Mm -hmm. And then we also had a magazine, Rubber Rebel. Um, so, oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Rubber in, the, in the 90s. It yeah. no longer exists. But, um, yeah. yeah. And David Bowie was the first mm -hmm. real gender bending. Yep. He kind of fucked with America's mind. Yep. And his music was great. Yep. So my next one is... Um, I'm still in my alternative phase, and I'm still stuck in 1992, but Tears for Fears was one of mm. my favorite bands at the time, and they came out with the album Sowing the Seeds of Love in 1992, and they, uh, for three songs, they brought on Olita Adams, which was this amazing oh. mm. female vocalist yeah. out of London. They sang a song, Woman in Chains, and... Of course, it had kind of an s &M undertone to me, Woman in Chains, but it was really about breaking off the shackles of either a relationship or I equated it to a religion again. I also equated it to my mother being so um, tied to her religion and just wishing she could break those chains. Um, but that song, I sat, I did light a candle in my room and just listen mm -hmm. to the vocals, uh, it, it had a very profound effect on me, and to this day, it's one of my favorite songs still. Uh, Tears for Fears uh, uh, with Shout. Um, they, it, it, both Tears for Fears and Depeche Mode had a lot of shining the light back on society, uh, which I really liked at that time. Uh, so that was my profound Tears for Fears. Nobody else, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. I, I love Tears for Fears. Okay. Okay. It's on Woo. your sex music album. Okay. <laughs> you have a lot of Depeche Mode in your sex music. Yeah. <laughs> people are people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Pig, what's yours? Oh, my fourth, I would have to say, is um, a song by Buffalo Springfield, which if when you look them up, if you Google it, it was kind of, they ended up all going off to be extremely famous on their own. But it was a, call, a song called For What It's Worth. And remember, you know, we're talking about, you know, from the 60s and 70s, what influenced us. And it's like Ohio, where it's influenced me ever since about activism, peaceful activism, but effective activism. And, you know, if you listen to the words to it, it really talks about... Um, you know, us fighting for our rights, people fighting for their rights, and the toll it takes on people, but also, you know, what it does to you individually. And, you know, when Black Lives Matter started doing a lot of really effective protests, it was really interesting to me that some of the news stations, some of the cable news, because they got to be on 24 hours a day, actually prefaced it with that song. And I thought, oh my God, they're calling all the way back to the civil rights movement in the 60s and the early 70s, and it was really appropriate. So that's why I chose that song. All right, Graylin, what's your next surprise? Well, my next surprise is going to be with Prince. Okay. Uh, um, because, you know, I talked about Tina Turner sure. awakening me sexually. I think Prince sort of captivated that. When I did um, my drummer fantasy, when I won Mr. Drummer, I used the Prince song, Do Me Baby. Oh, yeah. And that song... <laughs> That song was my fuck song, just to put uh. it that way, because all the lyrics were, you know, do me baby like you've never done before. And that was in my head as I was looking for a leather daddy at that time. That was my thing. It's like, just do me. I want to be done. I want to be used. I want all of that. And that was because of Prince's do me, do me baby. So since you were used to doing it, you performed it for fantasy? Sing I a few bars. <laughs> And for those who don't know, a fantasy within like a scene or a context, no, like the fantasy, talent yeah. portion. You're, right. You're doing something to a song, whether it's bondage or a, a blocking demo, something something that makes you stand out. Yeah, but, you, that's actually a good point. Fuck songs. We didn't have this on our list, but what is your fuck song? Any CD by my ex, J.D. Slater. Oh, okay. oh yeah. 
Uh, what Which, you, what's your anything book? by Nine Inch Nails. Wow, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I did not see that one go. Me either. Wow. <laughs> and then now mine, we know. <laughs> now we know. Mine, when I came out and started doing S and M scenes, there wasn't a single time in the early '90s that I wasn't in a dungeon and didn't hear the Enigma album. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 yeah that was chanting, the rock chant. under chant. It was Enigma was the best sex music. And, and the so soundtrack it, to. Um, Passion of Christ. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that was a really, really big dungeon. dungeon. Well, Blow Buddies used to have Nine Inch Nails playing all yeah. the time. Do we have to That's explain why. Blow Buddies? <laughs> Blow Buddies. <laughs> Blow Buddies. Blow Buddies. Blow Buddies was a sex club. <laughs> <laughs> but that explains that. Blow Buddies was the sex club. Exactly. <laughs> the sex club. It's actually going to relate to my next song. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> it what does. Next Perfect song? segue. So my next song is... Walk the Night by Scat Brothers. <laughs> now, before anybody no. assumes Scat it, I know, I Scat know, Brothers, I know. it's spelled S K A T T. It's uh -huh. Scat Brothers. And it's a jazz technique. And it's so, it was 1979. I'm in a sex club, and all of a sudden I hear Walk the Night, which kind of became a gay BDSM anthem. It was all about walking the night and cruising and having sex in alleys and clubs. And, and here I am in the sex club in Los Angeles and it comes on and I, let's say I was mid activity and I just thought it's a song that actually is talking about what I'm doing. And I had never heard that before. So that was that's my, great. that was, that's a very important song for me. And I have played that song probably 200 times. Wow. That's great. Okay. Can I get a Dance the Night Away and Walk the Night remix, please. Okay, that'd be, good. And, that'd be good. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. Oh, and I and this song was in uh, the movie Megan. Oh, was so, it? Really? Yes, oh, yes, they used it in Megan. So See, a lot of using old stuff. Yeah. Over so because so, well, it's good stuff. Yeah, it's really guttural and visceral, yeah. and it's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my next one. I'm gonna have to give a little shout out to Madonna, because Madonna. No matter what the kids think of her today and politics, and yes, she cashed in, she appropriated some cultures, but she was the first, first artist to really embrace gay. Mm -hmm. um, and she was the first artist to unapologetic unapologetically um, embrace being sexual and she put out a book the sex book where she was just fully naked what what artists would do that usually they would hide that they did play ballet before um, she put that out she came out with that al album erotica which was all S&M yeah. themed um, she um, did poppers on Instagram live yeah, but that's <laughs> so. It, I, she, she does some. Thinking. She does some things for shock value, and I understand that. And she's laughing all the way to the bank, but she actually, I think, there's the undertone of her believing it and wanting to yes, shake the system up. She has an authenticity to it, not just being provocative to be provocative, but sh so. And I really got that when she responded to the backlash to her sex book and erotica album, uh, she um, did a song called Human Nature. Mm. And in that video, all latex, the guys were hot in latex, yeah. and she's like, I'm not sorry, it's human nature. Right. And she was unapologetic, she was unabashedly saying, if you want to be sexual, if you want to be into s and no one should judge you for this. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do it blatantly. I'm going to be in your face about it. And I'm not going to apologize. And I think that was a big part of, I think it resonated with a lot of people. And it was a big part of her success. Um, and yes, sure, she did it's... it to sell albums. But I also think she really believed it. And that human nature one really gave me the it's okay to be kinky yeah. um, at that time, and she she always had the hottest dancers. She uh, she she also was always ethnically diverse in everything mm -hmm. she did from the beginning, yeah. way before it was trendy. Um, so I give lots of props to Madonna. And, and, well, I was just gonna say that that's my favorite music video of all time. Yeah, yeah. And so I recommend viewers. Look it up, Human Nature, the music video, it's really remarkable. Yeah. But there is some cultural appropriation there, and I'm glad that you 
admitted that and brought that well, I know up. She, I mean, it, you she, know, the whole Vogue slammed. thing. I know, and, that was the I mean, but, but I have I have some mixed feelings about it. You know, yes, it definitely was cultural appropriation. Yeah. I don't like that. However, she did bring it to, bring voguing to a larger audience. Much but I wish she had given much more credit to the people who were actually doing the that. The club kid, and she, yeah. could, she could have done that. But I also think if you look at her uh, documentary, Truth or Dare, I've seen that. she was being very real yeah. uh, in everything she did with all of her backup dancers. And mm -hmm. I don't think that was for show. No, um, no, and I, I agree think with that. I agree. Did, I, agree. Yeah. I think she did really embrace the culture and she still does to this day if you look at the things she's doing she's partying out doing all sorts of things I agree. that you wouldn't think a woman her age should a white woman her age should be doing well, you know what's funny i remember when you got the ray of light album me yes because you talked about it all the time <laughs> Oh, really? You've got to hear this. You've got to hear this. You've got to hear this. It's like we were on set for a movie and you were like so into that. that oh, album. yeah. I really was. Like, oh, yeah. You were, you were all about it. It's, <laughs> it's my favorite Madonna album. Is really yeah, really mine too. No, I don't want to take anything away from Madonna because I think everything you said is true on top of the fact that when she performed in Russia, she got out on stage and yeah. it was. She was mm. fined a She's million like, dollars. If, if I go to jail, so go to be jail. it. And she was trying to advocate for what Russians and now our Republican Party want to do to gay people. But I do have to say this. Janis Joplin, in the 60s, the mid-60s, everybody, every other woman, they had beehive hair and sweater sets. And Janis Joplin here in San Francisco came out straight hair, flowers in her hair, no bra, T-shirt showing nipples, and she did that in '66 and '67. Now, uh, nothing against Madonna, because Madonna did incredible things. But Janice, you know, she was one of the first people really just rocking out and being herself. Well, she was very San Francisco. She, oh, she I, just looked like yeah. what we were at that time. And she was with the Grateful Dead, the San yeah. Francisco Stone. Oh yeah, and absolutely. Sly in the Family Stone. Right. Reclaiming my time. Reclaiming okay. my time. <laughs> <laughs> Is Janice Joplin your? <laughs> no, but I... Okay, so you're just saying you're... That's fine. But he's San Francisco sound. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, then you go. With all right, my the, last yeah. one, and I have to say that it, it's all in the same theme. And remember, it's because we were talking about what influenced us. And it's a song by the Rolling Stones called Gimme Shelter. And I got to say, the lyrics to Give Me Shelter, and I'll just do a little, you know, the refrain from it is, you know, rape, murder, it's just a shot away, a shot away. And that was the refrain to Give Me Shelter. And I will tell you, he, they were banned from performing in Latin America till just, I think, in the late 90s. And, you know, back in that time, people just went for it. And, you know, lyrics were far more, I think, far more descriptive and honest about what was happening and then over the years what i've noticed in music and a lot of it that i love it just got so toned down you know and from what was going on in the 60s and 70s and you know i think we need a resurgence of it uh oh Huh? Okay. Good. Under two minutes. I'm, I'm yeah. 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 Things yeah. Things are moving right along. Yeah. Yeah. We, are <laughs> we are impressed. We are impressed. We are impressed. So, and th that was your fifth, right? That was my okay, fifth. Okay, this is my All fifth. All right, last song. Last song. Okay, um, I'm going to go with Aretha Franklin for uh, my last uh. one because early, early on, when I was six, seven, eight years old, I spent a lot of time with, with my uncles and my uncles weren't very nice to women, especially black women. There was some, there was, you know, my uncles were pimps and, and let's just put that out there. But my aunts would always play Aretha Franklin because we went there on Sundays. And to me, that that showed the the pain and the love that black women have for their men. And so, Throughout my life, I've tried to look at that and being, understanding the what black women have gone through over time. And Aretha Franklin was that voice yeah. throughout her entire life. She was the voice for black women to say, you know, we are facing injustice. Uh, look at what religion has done to us. And also embracing religion the yeah. way she did with, you know, 
some of her music there. So I think that Aretha Franklin just covered everything in my life in terms of being black and respecting black people and respecting black women especially. And she showed up. She Always. wasn't, it wasn't just about talk. If Martin Luther King said, I want you here, mm -hmm. she was she, there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, she, she walked her talk and I have the utmost respect for her. Yeah, with well, the Obamas she, as well. Yeah. She, went, right. she went through all history. But what she us. did for women, she was one of the first who stood up and said, yes. no, I won't do that. Yeah, no, right. I will do that. No, right. I'm not doing, she really stood up for women in general mm -hmm. when they had no power. I mean, back then people don't realize they, women could not even get a credit card unless it was mm -hmm. co-signed by their husband or another man. People don't realize yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Most of this music, the Civil Rights Amendment, didn't even come until 1964. And these were people that were performing and mm -hmm. trying to not only show their talent, but the business side of it. And Aretha Franklin was one who told oh, yeah. people where the cow yeah. ate the cabbage. Oh, right. Absolutely. Wait, <laughs> where the cow ate the cabbage? You never heard that? No. <laughs> I've, I've never heard that phrase. I mean, uh, we were just going to gloss over it until you just until you brought it up. Was that a band? <laughs> <laughs> it's an old, say, old Irish saying. I'm Irish. I've never heard it. <laughs> I don't know. It's an old pig saying. Okay. <laughs> oh, when the pig ate the collard greens. There we go. Wow. <laughs> uh, so I could have had living for the city. You could have. You could have, but, but he didn't. Did. <laughs> he slipped that one in. Did you notice? Uh -huh. <laughs> that was one of my favorites. Stevie Wonder was. All right, reclaiming, reclaiming. <laughs> reclaiming. <laughs> my time. <laughs> Race. What's your final song? <laughs> my final song. Uh, I would have been 30 years old, so we're talking 1984, mm -hmm. and it was the first time I had ever heard someone overtly talk about the style of sexuality I really liked at the time, which was Power Dynamic Exchange. Mm -hmm. And it's Master and Servant by Depeche Mode. Oh, yeah, yeah. Depeche Mode is great. And um, I love the song, I played it a lot, but the, it, was, it meant a lot to me that this style of sex that I had been doing for years and years and years was all of a sudden celebrated in a popular song. Yeah, it's very popular. And it, it really, really resonated with me. So um, it was validating is yeah, really what great. it was. Uh, and that goes back to my alternative roots yeah. too. Yeah. So I listen to a lot of Depeche Mode. I love Depeche Mode. Okay, my final song, I have to give a big prop to George Michael, who I'm yes. wearing today. And everyone's got concert t-shirts, which I love. We'll talk about that in a second. Reclaiming my time. <laughs> 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 George Michael, I think he struggled a lot. So he came to fame very quickly with uh, Wham. Um, and then he became a solo artist. And then he was arrested in, when was it, 1998 uh, for cruising in Will Rogers Parks in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And instead of, and I think he, he kind of went in hiding for a little bit while it blew over, but then he came out with a song, uh, Outside, uh, mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. let's go outside. And he just kind of blew the doors off and this destigmatized cruising. Mm -hmm. uh, he's like, this is who I am. This is when he came out as gay too. There'd been a lot of chatter whether he was gay or not. He kind of flirted with the bisexuality thing. But when he finally just said, okay, I'm gay, I cruise, get used to it, kind of thing. And it's a great song. He made a great pop song. Yeah. It's a great video. Yeah. Um, but it also, at that time, just made me feel comfortable being gay. Yeah. Uh, this mega artist, and he had a phenomenal voice, wrote mm -hmm. all his own mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. which was uh, yeah. very good at that time. Um, and uh, he just, he's one of my favorite artists to this day. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. I can say something about George Michael as well. Mm -hmm. Not to go back to one, you know, I'm a big fan, but Joan Baez did a song in his <laughs> call. <laughs> Kansas. <laughs> Joan Baez. All, <laughs> road, all roads lead back to Joan no, Baez. Yes. 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 But, uh, but he wrote this song called Hand to Mouth. Uh -huh. And if you have a chance to listen to it, it is so moving. And he wrote all the words to it, and she performed it, and it's fantastic. George Michael wrote, wrote it? Wrote yeah. it, 100%. Oh, okay, okay. He wrote it, and she wow. performed it. <laughs> Way to tie those two together. <laughs> <laughs> he also did that duet with Aretha Franklin. Yes. Uh, oh, he did? Yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Zoom and Who. 
uh, oh, which was amazing. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So, um, Interesting. That's right. He did. And yeah. Elton John, I think, gave him, uh, they became buddies. Elton John really gave him credibility uh, early on in his career. That uh, There's a documentary about George Michael that is phenomenal. I, it made me cry on the play. Because I always wondered what happened to Andrew Ridgely, because he just mm-hmm. kind of faded away right. after Wham. I was like, was there any hard strike? And no, Adam, J- or, uh, he just... He just said, no, George is the better performer. Let him go. Let him shine. Mm-hmm. And I don't know a lot of that. people that would be able to do right. that. Yeah. You know, we didn't we didn't say much about Elton John, too. I right. Mean, yeah. even, even early on, he was extravagant. No, that's not the word. Flamboyant. Well, flamboyant. He was, he was very flamboyant. flamboyant. Never apologized for it. Uh, I think he was late into coming out. Coming out was not something you did right. early on in a no. musical it career. It right. ruined careers. Right. Ruined right. careers. Right. Ruined careers. But you know, they they always did this wink and a nod mm-hmm. to it. Uh, you knew, um, and so did everyone else in the industry. Um, yeah. Well, he was the rock version of Liberace. Well, did you know I that mean, he, he was also uh, Elton John was um, Patti LaBelle's pianist. She, he was? Really? Yes. Early on. Yep. Yep. I did not know He this. was Patti LaBelle's pianist. That's funny. Yeah. It's like how... Um, and, and to clarify for the viewer, he's saying pianist, not yeah. penis. Pianist. Pianist. <laughs> but it's just like how Barry Manilow was Brett yeah. Miller's pianist. Yeah. 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 All right. So that's all good. Quickly, uh, go around and tell us what shirt you're wearing. I am wearing Alabama Shakes. It's a newer group with a older soulful sound. Wow, okay. You? This came from a concert I saw in Las Vegas, which I say to people is the best rock concert I've ever been at, ever. And it was Adam Lambert fronting Queen. Wow. And it, talk about a voice. I have never heard a man's voice sing like that when I saw it. It's absolutely remarkable. Incredible. I have George Michael, who's one of my favorite artists, like we just discussed. And I have Orb, which I'm borrowing from Race, because sadly, I had many, many concert t-shirts, and I'm so old, they're long, God knows where, but I know once I saw one on Haight Street that was up there, kind of ragged for $250, and I thought, oh my God, I had that shirt when it was <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why you don't throw things out. And then, and then to wrap up, I'm very curious, Puppy, what is your yeah. favorite song? You know, I was just thinking, I didn't get any chance, but Little Nas X, Kim Petras, uh, Queen, and then probably Troy Sivan would have been my four choices. Not that I was asked until the very end what I had in my mind. Um, <laughs> but I think the important thing to really focus on is you were asked. saving the best for last well i want to give a huge shout out to the puppy who keeps us on task and does all the editing and all the post-production that he's going to need to do and is also going to do a spotify playlist that you can all listen to of all the songs we talked about today um so if you want to you can check it out it's right here Uh, Samson, our editor, will put it there. So I'm going to call time on that. Please leave your comments down below of your favorite music. Go check out our merch shop at safewordshop.com. We're wearing none of it right now, but we have some amazing things. Huge shout out to our sponsors, Mr. S Leather and Leather Daddy Skin Co. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye!